Whoa, three Albedo videos in a row? <laughs> Don't say I never do anything for you guys. Just make sure you tune in for my Gilgamesh one coming out later this week, and watch this one till the end so I can just talk a bit about how you can support the channel. And no, it's not a Patreon pitch. So here we are with this video, that will hopefully answer the question to the title by not actually answering the question at all. How strong is Albedo? We've actually never seen her fight, or even step foot into combat for that matter. Yet, there's gotta be something other than her superior administrative skills that grants her the position of Guardian Overseer. So let's take a look at everything from her class and race build, to her abilities and the equipment that she carries, and see exactly what that something is. While we will start with her class and race, you should know that the Overlord Source material is notorious for giving almost no information on mechanics like races, classes, and abilities. The best that you'll usually get is just a name. Fortunately, it's not too hard to speculate a little on what those classes or races may be able to do just based on their name alone. I mean, I'm sure many of you already are aware that Overlord's mechanics are very, very, very heavily based on the tabletop role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons so you can get a lot of hints on races just by looking them up in that game. Classes, on the other hand, are something that you'd see in almost any MMO, so that's a straightforward concept in itself. What we do know is that classes come in three varieties. Common, which according to the web novel maxed out at level 15, and were available to anyone at character creation. Uncommon maxed out at level 10, and required the user to meet specific requirements, such as gaining certain levels in other classes, and or completing a particular quest in the game. And finally, there's the rare, which maxed out at level 5, and had a long list of requirements that needed to be met, or were otherwise well hidden by the devs. You can learn about the full extent of races and classes by checking out my video covering the known mechanics of Yggdrasil. But just keep in mind that for this video, you're going to hear a bit of speculation mixed in with all the facts. Now, let's get started. Albedo is part of a collection of races known as demons. The race of demons, like most denizens of Nazarick, fall under the category of heteromorph, which, in short, means that she doesn't just have one race, but rather has access to a full racial class tree in addition to the ordinary job class tree. As they max out one racial job, heteromorphs could literally morph from one race into a more powerful variant of it, unlocking the ability to continue leveling in that new race. The name itself is derived from a real-life group of animals who morph as part of their development cycle. You know, like how caterpillars change into butterflies. So 30 of Albedo's 100 levels are dedicated to racial classes, though her character sheet only confirms that 10 of them are in the Imp race. It is suspected by the fans that she also has levels in Succubus. <laughs> I wonder why. And then she also has Nalfishni, which we'll talk about later. But starting with the Imps, from a mythological standpoint, they're just small, mischievous, winged creatures. Imp is probably just a derivative race for most, if not all, flying demons, since Demiurgus also has imp levels and can fly. Succubae, on the other hand, which I'm now officially coining as the new term for Albedo, are mythological monsters who would tempt mortals with their sexual allure, only to drain them of their life or drag them to hell. We know for a fact that Albedo is called a succubus by other characters, including Ainz, so it's pretty safe to say that she actually has levels in it, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee it. We don't even know for sure if the racial class even existed as an option in the game, and it's not ever explicitly stated that she has any of the supernatural abilities that might be possessed by a succubus. Those include the ability to charm people or drain them of their life energy. That said, her stunning beauty is definitely implied to be quite alluring, so it's probably a safe assumption. Now, a Nalthashni in Dungeons & Dragons judges damned souls that fall into hell and relishes in meting out their punishments. They are among the more intelligent of demons, and generally disdain combat as they see it as being beneath them. However, they can still easily succumb to bloodlust and battle rage. Nalfishni is the most contentious and speculative. You see, Albedo is one of the few members of Nazarick who are a special type of heteromorph, one that can actively transform, gaining new abilities but losing others. We actually saw this type of behavior exhibited by Demiurgus at some point during Season 1. You see, some of the guild members of Ainz Ulgon liked the idea of their NPCs having final forms that they could transform into. Their final form would thus be far more powerful, but far more monstrous looking than their base humanoid form. So most of the evidence that Albedo can use her heteromorphic abilities to transform into a Nalfishni are circumstantial. The one that initially set the fan theories flying was actually the Bass scene from Season 3 Episode 1, 
since we hear her stomping around like a giant, and then Shaltier calls her Harry. Though that could imply something else. Other things about Nalthusnees that seem to fit into place are her haughty yet quick-tempered personality, the resemblance of her wings, her high intelligence, and a few other small details. The remainder of Albedo's levels were focused on the defense-oriented Dark Knight archetype. Namely, she has 10 levels in Guardian, 5 levels in Blackguard, 10 levels in Unholy Knight, 5 levels in Shield Lord, and then 40 other levels that are unspecified. She supposedly has levels in the Dark Knight class as well, but that could just be a term for the general category, which includes all these classes, and not necessarily a class on its own. While we don't have the exhaustive breakdown on what these classes actually do, what we do know is that Albedo is among the top warriors in all of Nazarick, specifically due to the fact that she's essentially the tankiest. I mean, with classes called Guardian, Blackguard, and Shieldlord, you can imagine that she has quite the high defensive stats. Just look at her HP and physical and magic defense stats, <laughs> they're all practically at 100. So it's not too hard with this information, and with the names that we've been given, to speculate on what these classes are capable of doing. A class like Guardian might be useful for protecting oneself or others, while Shield Lord might boost her ability to use shields. Blackguards in Dungeons and Dragons are basically evil paladins that made a pact with an otherworldly evil creature in exchange for power, and were probably a rare variant of the Unholy Knight class, since that also sounds like an evil paladin. So as a paladin style character, she's probably got a variety of utility spells, self-healing, smite attacks, and blessing or curses to go along with her high defense. Now if we shift over to her combat specs, as I had just stated, Albedo is one of the top 5 warriors in all of Nazarick. With Rubedo being at the top, then Shaltir with her 1v1 PvP specialized build that can beat almost any other character in a straight up fair fight, then a 3 way tie between Kakutis, Albedo, and Sebas. Kakutis being this glass cannon type character with unrivaled offensive capability. I mean, he's got 4 arms that can each carry incredibly powerful weapons. Then Sebas has a nice balance between offense and defense. Sort of like an in-between of Kakutis and Albedo, since Albedo falls into the defensive spectrum, boasting the tankiest build. In fact, there exists a sort of rock-paper-scissors relationship between the three of them due to the particularities of their build. Kakutis beats Albedo, Albedo beats Sebas, and Sebas beats Kakutis. So something like DPS beats tank, tank beats hybrid, and hybrid beats DPS. Sounds like something that you might see in your typical MOBA. This list of course doesn't include magic casters like Mare, who could probably beat everybody else other than Shaltir with the overwhelming destructive power and versatility of his magic. It also doesn't include support builds who would be useful in a teamfight, like the mysterious 7th member of the Platus, Oriel Omega. And it also doesn't take into account Ainz's most valuable weapons of tactics, strategy, planning, information, and of course, cash shop items as he had demonstrated in his fight against Shaltir, despite the overwhelming disparity between their builds. But focusing on just Albedo now, even though her defensive capabilities are unmatched in Nazarick, it's not just her combination of equipment and abilities that grant her such a powerful defense. Her innate defenses are abnormally powerful even without her equipment. In fact, she once took a punch from Demiurgus straight in the abdomen and barely felt it. He actually took more damage to his hand hitting her than she did from him. She can also take one of Kakutis' most powerful attacks, his so-called Immovable Wisdom King Strike, which requires him to stand still and channel power for several seconds. Though she did get moderately injured, it was not enough to be life-threatening. We can use her character sheet to confirm her durability. She's tied with Kakutis and Sebas for the highest HP at 100. And then she has the highest physical defense at 95, Magical Defense at 95, and Resistances at 90. While these stats are merely relative, and exist only to give you a rough method of comparing the various Guardians, it confirms that she's the most tanky character in Nazarick against both physical and magical attackers. Her high resistances also let her resist debuffs and negative status effects, including instant kill attacks. So for example, she could be attacked by spells like Ainz's Grass Part, but not die. Albedo also has a variety of skills related to her role as a tank, but she's been involved in so few fights that we really only know of a few. First off is Transposition. This allows her to instantly swap places with an allied friendly unit. The gauge of the distance that it can cover is at least a couple dozen meters, if not more. Then she is capable of parrying melee attacks using her parry active. 
and this grants a chance of success depending on the skill and power of the attack. For ranged and projectile attacks, she can use missile parry to completely negate it, and if successful, reflect it back completely at the attacker using counter arrow. Then she has what's called the Walls of Jericho and Aegis, which are both skills that appear to temporarily boost her defense. Though their exact nature is unclear, they could boost physical defense, magical defense, resistance, health regeneration, or some combination of any or all four of those, though damage reduction seems like the most likely. Lastly, we know she can summon a Bicorn at will and use it as a mount, though as we recently saw, it won't really go anywhere due to her still being pure and whatnot. Aside from Albedo's personal problems, demons in general tend to be able to summon lesser demonic entities to do their bidding, and this may be a function of that ability. It's not known whether any of these skills have cooldowns, daily usage limits, or can just be used freely. But normally, powerful skills like these in Overlord are subject to particular usage limits. She also appears to have the ability to heal her own wounds, either through the magic of her Dark Knight class or via passive health regeneration. And finally, the most important ability that Albedo has is the option to redirect the complete damage of a single attack onto her armor, something that she could pull off up to three times per day. This effect works regardless of the power of the attack and is capable of tanking even a super tier spell, though it only redirects the damage itself and not any other potential negative effects, so it will not help against attacks that do not deal damage. But what this means is that Albedo can survive three hits of the most powerful attack possible in a single fight, with only the cost of heavy damage to her armor. Speaking of her armor, let's talk about her equipment now, of which she has three notable pieces, the first being the world item Ganungagap. In Norse mythology, Ganungagap is the primordial void that existed in the universe prior to the cosmos and to which the universe will eventually return to during Ragnarok. In Yggdrasil, it's the name for a world-class item that was owned by the guild Eins Ulgon and which had been given to Albedo by Tabula Smaragdina without permission of the other guild members. While its precise special power is not explained, it appears to have something to do with dealing damage over a large area to physical objects, so perhaps it swallows things into a void like a black hole. In its ordinary form, it's shaped like a wand, though it also has the ability to transform itself into an alternate version which Albedo normally uses as her primary weapon, though its alternate appearance is unknown since Ein's forbidder from carrying it into battle back in Season 1 out of fear of losing it to an enemy. Even though this is a world-class item, it's not as powerful as even a specialized divine-class weapon against individual targets. Instead, it seems to have been intended to give Albedo either something like a wide area of effect attack, or the ability to break through even the toughest physical objects, which could, for instance, help her gain aggro or shred armor but who knows when we'll find out this weapon's true nature. Next up, we've got her armor, Hermes Trismegistus. It's a divine class item that was created by Tabula specifically to work best with Albedo's special ability to redirect damage. It's named as a reference to the author who was said to have founded Hermeticism. This author also allegedly wrote the Emerald Tablet, so I bet you're seeing the pattern here. It's fairly weak for a divine class armor, which is a fact that initially confuses both Albedo and Shaltir. It's got very few in the way of defensive enhancements, special abilities, magical resistances, or even stat buffs. Nearly everything in the armor was designed to increase its durability. But why? Well, it was so that it wouldn't break if Albedo did use her ability to redirect the entire damage of a single attack onto it. Because of this, the armor was designed with three layers. A skin-tight liquid bodysuit that boosts her physical abilities, a full-body undershirt mail that provides decent defensive stats, and an outer layer of plate that protects and reinforces the inner layers. So even if she was attacked with something that could deal enough damage to destroy her armor, it would only destroy one of the three layers. Many useful enchantments were sacrificed in order to achieve this effect, but in reality, the three-layer mechanism made it little more than a gimmick useful for buying time in the face of true power. Her build was never intended for anything more than absorbing a few hits from a level 100 player in order to buy the guild members a precious few seconds. Unfortunately for Albedo, each layer covered her whole body, so having her armor broken while protecting Ainz wouldn't help her expose some of her skin to him, which would have been the ideal situation for her. This ended up being quite annoying and concerning for her, especially since the armor was a creation of the Supreme Beings, so thinking of it as inadequate in any way was practically a treasonous thought. And finally, as we all know, like most Guardians, Albedo was granted the Ring of Ainz Ulgon, 
a piece of equipment owned by every former member of the guild and which could be used to bypass the spells and mechanisms that disabled and or disrupted teleportation throughout the various floors of Nazarick. Without this ring, an invader would have to go through each floor one by one. Those attempting to teleport could be pulled from their intended destination and into a trap or ambush, or merely just prevented completely from finishing their spell. Unfortunately, yet again for Albedo, Ainz is paranoid of any potential foe obtaining this ring, so he forbids guardians from wearing the ring during any operations outside of the tomb. And that finishes up her equipment, so that's pretty much everything about Albedo. Though the question how strong is she should really just be how tanky is she, and clearly the answer is a lot. She's literally a damage sponge, which honestly wasn't the type of build that I initially thought that Tabula would have given her, but I guess if Rubedo is meant to be the super DPS and Igretto is the stealth informant, then I guess tank would be the way to go. Anyway, that's pretty much it, so that means the next person I cover will be decided through the poll that should now be posted on my channel page. So go vote for who you think should be covered next. Now, before I go, just a quick little thing on how you can support this channel. Honestly, it's really easy. I'm not asking you for money or anything. You just gotta watch something other than my Overlord videos. I know, right? You probably didn't even know, but yes, I do upload stuff that's not related to Overlord. So whether it's my Fate videos, which are even more rich in lore than these ones, or even my news videos that cover the newest upcoming anime, if you happen to watch either of those, then the YouTube algorithm will recommend my lesser popular content to a wider audience, and it will overall help what we've built here grow. So yeah, if you got time, then check out my older Fate lore videos, any of my miscellaneous review type videos, or even just keep an eye out for a new non-Overlord related video, and I promise that that would help this community so so much more in the long run. But anyway, thank you so much for listening, thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!